the Bible says that he came, that Jesus came to set us free, you know, yeah. that he came to set the captives free and he came to release, you know, people from, from prisons and captivity. Like, okay, so people are, people are placed in captivity because of things that were done to them. Yeah. You know, different abuses, uh, abuse that we've experienced, you know, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, spiritual abuse, rejection, uh, abandonment, um, you know, different things that have been done to us where demonic garbage gets a foothold. Hello, this is Andrea from Our Daydream. Today we have another awesome guest. His name's Kevin Reardon. He is the co-founder of Set Free Ministries. This is going to be an awesome chat. We're going to be speaking about spiritual warfare. So I am super excited. So without further ado, here is Kevin. Hello. Okay. I think I'm, I'm in my son's room. My yeah. wife threw me out of the living room. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Now I wrote like out like kind of like a synopsis of what I wanted to talk to you about, and I was having a blast <laughs> with it. Um, I was invited to a church where you had um done a revival, and it really opened my mind up to a lot of things that. I mean, I kind of knew that certain things existed, but I really wasn't awoken to it all the way. But so I really want to talk to you about that here in a little bit. But for right now, like, can you tell me your your story? Like, um, what brought you to where you are today in life? I always feel like, you know, for the great ministers of God that have that anointing over them, they had to like walk through hell to get the keys before they started off on that journey. But do you think that that's part of your story too? Well, uh, I used to, Yeah. But I, but I don't anymore now that I understand the Bible and, and, and now that I understand uh, who I am in Christ and what we have, through the name of Jesus and, uh, and, and also what we have through the Holy Spirit. I used to think that the things that I went through were the things that kind of like, that, that kind of brought me to this place of functioning in the ministry that I'm functioning in. But now, now I realize that what I have, I've had it since I've been born again. Yeah. And, and not just, not just me, but any other, any and all believers have what I have. If that, if that makes sense. Yeah. It might make sense the more we talk. No, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. Um, it's like, like the spirit already dwells within you, but it's like whenever you like tap into that and just mm. decide that your story is no longer you then you can gain that connection that kind of gives you this knowledge that just comes out of nowhere. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I've, I've had this revelation, like I, like the anointing that's on my life. I've, I've had it since I said yes to Jesus and the spirit of God came into me and I've, and, and since I, when I said yes to Jesus, I received all authority, all authority that Jesus walks in, okay, has been given to his body. So the moment I was born again, I had the fullness of the spirit dwelling on the inside of me. All the power that was in Christ came to dwell on the inside of me. All the authority that was in the name of Jesus also rested upon me when I said yes, and, and every other believer, by the way. Yeah. When As soon as we say yes to Jesus, we inherit the name of Jesus and the authority that's in that name. And so as I've, as I've grown in the Lord, okay, the anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit didn't increase in me. The authority didn't increase in me, but my revelation of the anointing, yeah. the revelation of the power that's that awesome. I have, and the like revelation that. of the authority has increased. I like that. So, and that's Good. for every, that's every single believer. Amen. Can you tell us your testimony? 
Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I will say that my testimony, my story has kind of, you know, has kind of formed the kind of person I am, though. Okay, so I will say that. So I was, um, I was born into uh, an alcoholic family. My father was schizophrenic alcoholic, abusive, and just a very scary person, and grew up in a, in a very dysfunctional house. Um, in addition to that, I was born with problems with my fingers, right? So I was, I was teased relentlessly as, 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 as a kid, you know, in school, you know, kids, if they, if they see something different on you, they, they go on the attack, yeah. you know? And so I grew up, you know, feeling like, you know, with a lot of rejection, rejection from my father, you know, hatred from my father, rejection from kids, rejection from, you know, just, so I, I will say it was a pretty difficult, difficult life. I fought a lot a lot you know if you made you know I reached an age where if you made fun of me I'd, I'd try to beat you up um and uh you know as at, a, at an early age my father had an encounter with Jesus in a bar and my father's life was changed like he became a different person he was like delivered yeah and and so but but the problem was like I hated my father so it was like you know what if if you're into it I'm not you know, I'm, and, but, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm like eight years old. So what am I going to do? You know, it's like, if he says go to church, I got to go to church, you know, but I didn't, but I didn't want, I didn't want to go. You know, I hated it. Grew up, you know, in the church, but not connected to God whatsoever, you know, very with all kinds of insecurity, all kinds of rejection, as I said earlier. And then I got a little bit older and, uh, you know, started, you know, found girls and, you know, and tried to, you know, do, you know, doing what young guys try to do and addicted to pornography and just, you know, started smoking pot and hanging out with, you know, I was somebody who didn't like myself and I hung out with a bunch of people that didn't like themselves. And so we did dysfunctional things and right. which broke me even further. And uh, finally at 27 years old, you know, my father was always like, you know, he would, he would take his opportunities, you know, when he, whenever, you know, he would sit, when I reached, when I, when I would come to these low points in my life, you know, I would go to my dad and he would give me, he would give me Jesus, you know, every time, you know, like he was where I ran. That's incredible. You know, when, when things got ugly, you know, he was where I ran and he would always give me Jesus and, and I listened, but I didn't really do anything with it, you know, <laughs> and well, finally, I'm 27 years old and my whole, you know, the party was over, you know, I'd smoked a lot of weed and drank and, and here I was getting, you know, I mean, I'm 27, I'm an adult now, I'm not a kid anymore. And it's like, all of a sudden it's like the party was over, you know, and I was like, I, you know, I began sensing, I need to make some changes in my life. And, and next thing I know, God, like, basically brought me through this process where I began to lose everything. I lost, my friend, I lost my friends. I lost my job. I lost everything. All I had was this girlfriend, this girl, Becky, that I was with, you know, we'd probably been together for six years and, you know, and, and, and so it was uh, March 22nd, 2000. I, uh, we went to a, we went to a bar and I had gotten drunk and there was some guy that was hitting on my girlfriend and I got into a fight with him and, I was very insecure, very, very insecure. Got into a fight with him. We got in the car where me and my girlfriend are dry. She's bringing me back to the house. You know, she's not, not happy with me at all. And she just says, I, I don't want to be with you anymore. And I was like, all right. There was like this little voice on the inside that was like, don't fight this. It's, it's over. Now I realized that that little voice was God. You know, don't, don't try to, don't try to fight it. And I'm thinking to myself, now I had tried committing suicide a couple of times. Obviously I'd failed. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm thinking as I'm driving home, I'm like, I have nothing. 27 years old, I live with my dad. I have no friends, I have no job. Becky's, Becky's gone. I've got, I've got no gifts, I've got no talents. I've got nothing to live for. My life is absolutely purposeless now. 
I'm going to kill myself. And so my plan was, I was going to say goodbye to her. I was going to go in the house. I was going to, can I get an extension cord and hang myself? And so uh, I'm just waiting for her to leave. I give her a hug. I give her a kiss goodbye. I knew it was the last time I was going to see her. I knew it. She gets in her car. She's backing out of the driveway. And I wasn't praying. Okay. Now, mind you, I was not praying. I was more like taking the name of the Lord in vain. I was like, ah, Jesus. <laughs> and when I said his name, like his presence came, it was like... It was like the last little idol that I was hanging. She was my last little idol that, 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 you know, my last little object of worship that I had been hanging on to. And as soon as that, as soon as I released that idol, he came and, and, and I dropped to my knees and I could just feel the presence of God on me. I didn't even know what was happening honestly but I knew something like something supernatural was taking place and I began to repent like I repented before I knew it was cool to repent and I just started saying Lord forgive me for running from you forgive me for denying you forgive me God for putting everything in front of you and I just I was just crying I mean crying harder than I'd ever cried in my life and as I lay and I was on my face on my front front yard immediately sober, might I add, on my face, just crying my eyes out. And I could feel things coming out of me. On my front lawn, I was, I was born again. And I literally felt demons leaving me. Like it was, it was amazing, you know, and I went inside and I, and I went to bed and I remember waking up the next morning and, you know, every day of my life for 27 years, I couldn't remember a day that I didn't wake up with the thought that you should kill yourself, the thought that nobody loves you, you don't have any talents, your your life is worthless, you know. And I woke up that morning and I and I went down the checklist, right? <laughs> I'm laying there in bed. I only got like four hours sleep, which definitely wouldn't have helped my cause either. But I'm like laying, laying in bed and I'm thinking, okay. Uh, got no job, check. Got no friends, check. 27 years old, live with my father, check. Um, Becky's gone, check. And I'm laying there and I'm thinking to myself, man, I feel way too good. <laughs> I, like, I, had, like, I had the most amazing peace that I had ever known. And, uh, and so immediately I I I, uh, I set out to begin to tell everybody about this piece. And it wasn't because somebody in a church had told me, you need to now go and do evangelism, the Great Commission. It was, I met Jesus, and everybody in the world needed to know about him. Right. He, like, like, it was like, like I, I was filled with, and that was another thing. That's like I thought I was going crazy a little bit because I because I was filled with so much love that night. Like it was like for an hour I laid there on my front lawn after I got delivered. And it was like love, like just love, just washing through me and washing me out. And I had such a such an encounter with the love of God, like amazing and so here I was I was like filled with this love and I would see people right I would see (laughs) see people that I knew and I'd look at them and I would just start crying and they'd be like why are you crying man I'm like because I love you so much I mean it was like (laughs) it it was just like I'm like what's wrong with me you know but I I, I mean, it, it was, it was unreal, you know, and, and I, I like had this just, just passion to tell people about this love. Like, you don't have to feel broken. You don't have to hurt anymore. Like Jesus is real and he saves and he loves. And, and so that was, that was that, you know, and I, and so I, 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 I just immediately began telling people about Jesus immediately, just sharing what God, I didn't know anything. I didn't have any kind of theology. I didn't know any. I didn't know. All I knew was Jesus, that he saved me and that he loved me. And my mindset was, I don't know if Jesus saved me. And if Jesus loves me, then 
he wants to save you and he wants to show you his love. And that was my story. I call that like the lady at the well experience um, because it kind of like happened to me like that too. Like I really wasn't expecting it, but it happened. And once you like feel God outside mm. like the book and the church, but you actually understand that it's more than just a theology, it's real. Like it's real and you can feel it and you know that it exists and you see that like what it does like how could you not go into the land and just tell everybody you know like it's true it's real yeah it's like it's it's so much like that was my thought like like god is my father's religion you know like god like my thought was god is a religion and that night i realized that god he's he is not a religion a lot like, he is, like he touches people he yeah. speaks to people mm-hmm. he heals people you know you can feel you can feel him you know like he is he's not a religion but he is it is relationship you know and it's like my eye it was like my eyes came open oh my goodness yeah. I like what have I been doing for 27 years right. you know yeah. It was a part of your story that you needed to help other people out with. Um, but I think about too, and I've heard this from other people that were kind of got that anointing on them is like, um, you know, the Bible says that he will be a father to the fatherless. And so like, that was my situation too. I had a stepdad yeah. that treat me with hate and kids at school were really mean to me. And it was like, there was nowhere for me to go to where I could feel that I was accepted um or loved even like I grew up with more like hate is what I grew up with and so but God like kind of took over that position in my head like you know this too like this too shall pass just keep doing your best just keep you know being good um and things like that it was like God would speak in my ear but I ran from him I was an atheist for 17 years um I, at a point in time, I decided to run and, um, but I just feel like, and I was talking to a pastor about yesterday because I talked to a Satanist one time and he said that he would pray these beautiful prayers to God and so heartfelt and, and he would ask God to save him from his situation. No sooner he would get done with his prayer. He said that they would come in and beat me. And he, he's like, they would beat me bad. And he's like, and I was just a little kid. He's like, but it says in the Bible that only so many are chosen. And it was just that I wasn't chosen. So I decided to go the other way with it because I wasn't chosen. And, you know, I didn't think about it while he was there, but I did think about like giving him the love of God, you know? So I, and, and I seen mass changes happen in him while he was in, you know, in my presence, but, um, Later on, I got to thinking about it because my son on the weekends, um, he's being taught things that are not what I'm teaching him over here. And I got to thinking about, you know, even my childhood, how Satan was right there trying to take me out before I even got started. Yeah, right. You know, and Satan was right there trying to take you out before you even got started. For sure. Yeah. And that guy that became a Satanist. Satan was right there trying to take him out before he got started. And it's these chosen ones, I believe, like he thought he wasn't chosen, but just the the thought that, you know, Satan was trying to take him out before he even got started. It's like, I don't know. Like, I think you were probably a chosen one, a chosen vessel that Satan was trying to stop you before you even got a foot on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, I can, I, for sure. I mean, I, in my life, like people are blown away when I tell them how many times I've almost died, yeah. fell out of a car. You know, I was six years old. My back in the day, you remember when, when, when everybody had one of these those like huge boat cars with a yeah. with a with a with a vinyl back seat. You know, nobody wore mm-hmm. seat belts back then. Yeah. I remember my aunt going around a turn, and my little butt slid across that seat. I hit the door, the door swung open. I went out and slid across the, (laughs) I slid across the intersection and literally I stopped and I looked up and there was a dump truck tire literally right here. Wow, that's incredible. 
I was like six years old. Then going in for surgeries for my fingers, I stopped breathing. They couldn't get me back. They couldn't, they couldn't revive me. I wasn't breathing. And then I, and then I had surgery when I was 16. I had Rye syndrome. My brain was swelling. They told my parents, nobody lives through this. My entire family waiting for me to die. You know, all everybody at the hospital I came to. Yeah, I mean, it's so just so many yeah. times, you know, where the yeah. enemy tried to, and not to mention trying to kill myself, you know? Yeah, I mean, before you even hate, before you even find God truly, it's like, no, yeah. we're going to stop this before this even starts. Yeah, the enemy's trying to abort the call on your, he's, not trying, <laughs> yeah. he's trying to take you out, yeah. trying to take out yeah. your call. He sees yeah. it, you know? So, so it's so yeah. important to be born again in Jesus because you understand then that you weren't a victim <sighs> of. <laughs> you know, my son, I just <laughs> might want to edit that one out. <laughs> my son has this, he's going to love this. <laughs> Anyway, you were saying. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Yes, I. I uh, just see I you jump like something tried to bite your hand off. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, that's so funny! I went to put my foot up and stepped on it. I went no. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, to me, to me, you're a spiritual, like you're a master at spiritual warfare from what I heard in, um, you know, your testimony at the church and things like that. Um, but I guess people have their different views of spiritual warfare. And I think that you have a different view than most people. So can, can you explain to us what you believe spiritual warfare is? Well, what I believe spiritual warfare is, um, so I understand what you're saying, what you're asking me, but I'm going to kind of maybe take it. Do it. A little different, a little different than what you thought. The war is over. The war is over. Jesus went to the cross. He destroyed the works of the devil. The war is over. So now what I do is I just simply, I simply live my life from that place, from a place of victory, knowing that all authority in heaven and earth was that Jesus destroyed the works of the devil, that all authority in heaven and earth was given to him, and then he passed it on to his body. So now I have all authority. And again, like I said earlier, I have all power through the Holy Spirit. And so now my job on this earth is to enforce everything that Jesus, and that's the whole church's job, is to enforce everything that Jesus accomplished on the cross. So at the cross, Jesus, he died for sin. So we go and we preach salvation on the cross. Jesus died for, uh, for sickness. So we have authority to heal the sick on the cross. Jesus died to set people free from demonic bondage. So now we go out and we cast out demons, right? So that's, that's kind of like where the way I see it is like, you know, like spiritual, spiritual warfare, the battle's over. It's, it's really, it's really not, you know, it's, it's not really warfare as we, as we perceive warfare to be, it's simply going and putting the devil in his place. The Bible says that Satan is under our feet, right? So, right. so I guess like what you were alluding to and what you wanted to get to is, is the ministry of deliverance. So one of the things that I do is uh, I, I have a healing ministry. I pray for people for physical healing. And I also pray for people to be set free from demonic bondage. And, um, and so, you know, I've been doing that now for probably about 12 years. The Lord is, uh, the, you know, I, I've, I've learned a lot, you know, I've, I've read a lot of books and I've, and I've studied on, you know, the ministry of deliverance. I studied on the ministry of healing. But maybe the difference between myself and some other people is I've taken what I've learned and I've actually, well, kind of stepped out and, and, and tried to 
you know, okay, well, if they can do it, then I'm going to take this knowledge and now I'm going to do it. Right. And that's, and that's, and that's what I've done. And so I, uh, you know, I praise God for, for the fact, you know, and now, and now God uses me to teach others this stuff, but I praise God for the fact that I praise God for the fact that, uh, you know, that, that he uses me the way, the way that he uses me. And, and, and honestly, you know, um, you know, the Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? We write that, that our fight isn't against people. Our fight is against the enemy. And, uh, and so I have, you know, I like, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I have a lot of people, I mean, maybe not a lot of people, but I have people that come against me that come against me in the church because contrary to what people want to believe Christians, Christians can have demons. And I know this because I cast them out of them. Honestly, like the ministry of deliverance is more for the, is more for the believer than the unbeliever. Right. Because if you think about it, so if deliverance was only for the unbeliever, casting out demons was only for the unbeliever. Do you think now? So you cast a demon out of an unbeliever. Okay. They have no Holy spirit. An unbeliever doesn't know the word of God. In other words, an unbeliever has zero chance of staying free. Right. Cause right. they have no, they have, they, they don't have the God nature that's opposed to sin. They don't have the word of God, you know, so they're continuing to believe lies. So you can cast a demon out of them, but because of, you know, the human nature and, and the propensity towards sin, they're going to run right back into it and, and get demonized again. Also, when Jesus was talking to the Canaanite woman, when she came to Jesus and she said, uh, she said, Jesus, my daughter has a demon, you know, would you, would you cast this demon out of, out of out of her and jesus said to her you know del you know deliverance deliverance is the children's bread that's what it said deliverance is the children's bread you know and that's when she said even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the table but jesus jesus even said that this is that this ministry is for the believer if you think about sanctification sanctification is a big fancy word for becoming more like jesus right so if you think about sanctification, what is saying? So sanctification is becoming less like the devil <laughs> and becoming more like Jesus, right? So sanctification, that process is all about deliverance. It begins the moment we're saved, the moment we're born again, the moment we're born again, we're delivered from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God, right? Okay. And so, and so um, the process of sanctification is, is getting the devil's kingdom out of us, you know, the devil's ways and walking toward and walk and, and becoming more like Christ. So even the process of, of sanctification requires, it's nothing but deliverance, getting delivered from the old ways and becoming and becoming more Christ-like, going from glory to glory. Does yeah. that all does that all make sense? Yeah. Um, I I don't know. It's like and it's like Jesus, whenever he was baptized, um he was baptized in the water, he went into the wilderness for 40 days and was tempted by the devil. Um, and so and the devil spoke to him so but I also think like whenever I went from atheist to like pretty much being on Satan's team um to being a believer uh you know there's more stumbling blocks put in the way because now you're not a, a friend you're you know an enemy so uh yeah that's right yeah so it's like and and I feel that even three three years later, um, that it's like as soon as I lose some baggage or a situation that arises, something else, I and then I gain like this super, you know, um, closeness with God in that because I'm like, 
oh God, like, thank you for taking this burden off my shoulders. And I gain this closeness to him that I can walk through this storm and be at ease in that something else then will happen. <laughs> and then, Well, that's, that's the Christian life. I mean, the Christian life is, is just a process of, 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 of us becoming more like Christ and, you know, and, and it's a process of, you know, our flesh dying, you know, the Bible says, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it can't produce any fruit. And I mean, it's kind of, and, you know, talking about, you know, uh, I think it's in uh, John 15, where it talks about the pruning process, you know, and, and, and God is not so much concerned with how comfortable we are, yeah. but he's more concerned with the, with, the, <laughs> with the state of our heart. So, you know, that's, uh, you know, it's one of, one of the difficult things, you know, if you're gonna, if you're really going to pursue Jesus, and if you're going to do anything for the kingdom of God, he's, he's going to take you through process where your flesh is going to have to die. Yeah. But yeah. So, but with, with the ministry of deliverance, I mean, I, you know, there, there's a difference between like, you know, God, like taking you through hardship and the enemy just beating the snot out of you. Yeah. Right. Um, and that's, and that's kind of where, where God uses me. Like the Bible talks in Isaiah 61, right? It says that Jesus came to set the captives, set captives free and release people from the from, captivity from, for when and, he had placed them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That Captain. was profound to me because I was like, he, they have to, like, God has to put us in that captivity in order for us to really see the deliverance and his hand on our life. Cause we'll just think that we did it. Well, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think God puts us in captivity. I think that the enemy places us in captivity because the Bible, the Bible says that he came, that Jesus came to set us free. You know, yeah. that he came to set the captives free and he came to release, you know, people from from prisons and captivity. Like, OK, so people are people are placed in captivity because of things that were done to them. Yeah. You know, different abuses, uh, abuse that we've experienced, you know, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, spiritual abuse, rejection, uh, abandonment, um, you know, different things that have been done to us where demonic garbage gets a foothold right but then on the other can side happen and then that demonic thing just consumes you, you yeah know? like so, like yeah i mean when the gross. like i've seen you know so many people who have been physically sexually abused emotionally abused you know spiritually abused that in in those in those times of trauma the demonic garbage slips in and begins to like speak to you, begins to lie to you, begins mm -hmm. to tell you you're a piece of garbage, tell you nobody loves you. And what do we end up doing? We end up, we end up moving, going down a dysfunctional path, you know, because we feel, because we've been convinced by the enemy whispering in our ears that we're garbage. We begin to yeah. yoke ourselves to people who will hurt us. We give our bodies away to people. We engage in drugs. We drink alcohol. We do all that stuff that only breaks us even more. But on the same, but then with saying that the Bible talks about how he came to set, how he came to open prison doors. So who are the prisoners? So captives are people placed in captivity uh, as a result of somebody's sin against them. OK, then on the other side, you've got prisoners. Prisoners are taken or placed in prison because of our own sin, because of the things that we've done, you know, be, you know, as we as we, you know, you know, we've been we've been broken. We've been placed into captivity. We start engaging in sinful things as a result of the demonic lies that we believe. And then right. we start and then we start engaging in sin. And we be and we're and we become placed in even further bondage, you know. Right. But Jesus, he went to the cross, his blood was shed to set the captives free and to release those who are bound in prison. You know, yeah. Jesus, Jesus came to 
Jesus can't. I mean, it's the reason why he, it's the reason why he came. But like I said, I get, I get a lot of, I get a lot of believers that will, that will fight me on that. People who are watching this will probably be thinking, okay, so how does that work? How is it that a born again believer, that a, that a believer who has the spirit of God in them can have a demon? That's probably the, the elephant in the room. So shall I explain that? Okay. Okay. All right. So when a person, when a person is born again, okay, in Ephesians, Ephesians, I think it's in Ephesians four, it talks about when that, that a believer, it, that the spirit of God, when a, when a person is born again, spirit of God takes up residence in them and that person, and it is sealed until the day of, you know, until, until Christ comes back. So the spirit of God comes into a believer and, and, and their sin dead spirit is regenerated. Okay. Brought back to life and is then sealed. It's sanctified and sealed again that the, and what that means is the spirit of a believer is 100% made perfect and it's sealed, untouchable, Uncorru- uncorruptible, incorrupt, in, un- incorruptible. Incorruptible. Okay. Yeah. So then, so so we're 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 waiting for 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 glory, right? However, there is the part of the of of a person when they're born again that is not sanctified, but is being sanctified. So the Bible talks about how we're three we're a three part being. We're we're uh, a spirit, a soul, and a body. Okay, so the soul of a person is not sanctified, but as we pursue Jesus, it's being sanctified. Now, the soul consists of the mind, the will, and the emotions. So, while a demon, while a demon cannot possess a born again, a born again spirit, okay, because it's sealed. A demon can oppress a person in in their mind, their will, and their emotions, right? So, um, but as we as we pursue Jesus, and as we as we learn the truth, and as we come out of agreement with the enemy's lies, okay, the power of the enemy gets broken off of our life, and as we oh pursue Jesus. We're being set free from from the enemy. We're being set free from the lies. That's why the Bible says, "And you'll know the truth, and the truth, the truth will what? It'll set you free." Uh-huh. As we come into agreement with truth, the lies of the enemy are broken off of us, and we're getting and we're getting delivered. Okay, yeah. but so what? What people? Where people get hung up is the word possession. Okay, a born again. A born now, an unbeliever can be possessed by the devil. Okay. A born again believer, a, a blood bought believer, cannot be possessed by the devil. That's what I was going to ask you that at some point. Um, because right. I always believe that these negative thoughts that come into your head, you know, that's working against what God actually had told you. That that was possession of the, like the devil trying to possess you. Devil cannot devil cannot possess a believer. Okay, because we are we are now Christ's possession. We've been bought by the blood of Jesus, so we are now Christ's possession. Now, instead of possessing a believer, the enemy can absolutely oppress a believer. Okay. The enemy can absolutely oppress somebody. Big difference between those two words. Possession speaks of ownership. We will, we can, a believer cannot be owned by the devil. Got you. Okay. But when, but, but when we, when we sin, we open ourselves up to oppression. Okay. The Bible says we're, that we're the, we become the slaves of who we obey. Right. We, we, we can, we can absolutely be oppressed by the devil, but here, but like I said, 
as we're pursuing Jesus, okay, and and we're in the Word of God, and we're you know, and we're and you know, and we're getting a revelation of who He is and who we are in Him and what we have through Him. We begin to we begin to come out of agreement with the lies that we've been believing from the devil. Right. And as we do, we we become we're becoming less like less like the the man we were, the woman we were, but we be, and we're becoming more like Christ. So, like I said, so, you know, w- demonic oppression doesn't occur in our spirit. Spirit man, Our spirit man is born again, perfect, incorruptible. However, our mind, our will, and emotions are, is the place where, where the enemy oppresses us. Now, people say, well, I, okay, I, you know, I, well, I, I ask people, have you ever felt, you know, people say, oh, the devil can't, the devil, you know, demons can't, blah, 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 blah. And I'll ask them, have you ever felt depressed? Have you ever felt anxiety? Have you ever felt, you know, have you that's ever what felt I'm talking about? You know, it's like, what do you think yeah. that is? Do you think that's just like a mysterious blob right. that comes on you and makes you know it's the enemy? Right. It's it, these are these are demonic spirits that do this, right? Right. Can um, I tell you though, like my thoughts behind it is many Christians aren't born again is my belief system because in order to be like a lot of churches will do um the scripture that says that you will be saved right and then they believe that that's the born again but they hadn't actually died to who they were Mm. well i think you are very very correct in in that if you if we are preaching a weak gospel which the majority of the churches in, in america do Like they, like a lot of the altar calls that you hear in churches are geared to, you know, like, well, you know, if you, if you don't want to go to hell and you want to go to heaven, you know, you want to join the family of God, just pray this prayer. And then you'll be Uh, saved. Right. Because a gospel without repentance. Okay. Not telling somebody, look, you need to, it's not just praying some prayer. Okay. But it's making a decision that you're going to. Turn from your sin, like yeah, like I don't want this anymore. And God, I'm gonna, to the best of my ability, I'm turning from that, and I'm gonna go after you. Right now, that's the that's the true gospel. A false gospel produces false converts. Right, right, and 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 so there's a lot of believers that, and and I I I related once. Um, I did like a live, and I related like the difference between the atheist, the believer and the born again, like the believer is a lot like the atheist because I went from atheist to be in a year and a half. I was a believer. I was, it was basically the same construct. I still didn't believe in my steps. I still was tossed around. I still wasn't learning who God was or growing into that position. It wasn't until I was born again that I transformed into a completely different human being little by little. I mean, that's what the Bible talks about, the wheat and the tares, that the wheat and the tares will grow together. And, you know, so it talks about, well, don't pull out the tares because you'll pull out the wheat with it. There's a lot of people that, that, that have, they, they heard a false gospel. Okay. Just, yeah, just, just pray this prayer. You'd be good. And, and, and so, and they get love bombed. And so they find themselves in the church and, you know, and their, and their friends all change and what they do changes, you know, they start doing Christian things, but they still, but when they're away from, but when they're away from their Christian friends, they're still engaging in, you know, this, that, and the other. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I mean, the Bible says that we're, that, that, that we're going to have them with us, you know, that, that it's, it's, it's part of the, part of the deal, but I think absolutely. And for those people, you know, First things first, before you receive deliverance, you need you need the first deliverance. The first deliverance is being delivered from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. You know, so we're because there's a lot of people that are still like on step one. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah. But I agree with that. Yeah. As soon as I was reborn again, um, it really was like, you just seen things brand new. Like you said, like your emotions are woken up, like everything's brighter. Even that, just like seeing an airplane, I'm like, wow, how grand we are that we can do this. And it's like something that I've seen for (laughs) 
you know, 35 years of my life, but it was like, oh, so I was awoken to it. Like these bridges, I'm like, oh, we are so awesome. Like, and it was just, everything was so, so beautiful. But then, you know, uh, that time only lasted so long before Satan started coming back in saying, no, that's, you're not who God says that you are. You're this person. You're this person that was traumatized. You're this person that was hurt. Like you're the person that walked through these steps. And I would literally have to, you know, sing Jesus loves me for maybe an hour straight sometimes to try to get rid of this demonic activity that was taking place that was trying to pull me back. So it's definitely like, it's, it's not just a belief system. It's got to be a way of life because you have something that's trying to take that salvation away from you. Yeah, for sure. You know, with, when it comes to deliverance, okay. So the Bible says that the devil is the father of lies, okay? So a person who has demons in them, okay? person who has demons in them, like what those demons do is whisper lies in your ear. They tell you who you are. They tell you, you know, they tell you, you know, who you are. They tell you what you have. That's why, like, you know, you in certain churches, like you've got people that have been in the church for 30 years hearing the same messages and they're still spiritual babies because yeah. they've got demonic garbage on the ins on, on the inside of them. Okay. So they'll hear a verse like for God so loves the world that he, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. They'll hear a verse like that. And then the enemy will whisper to them. Okay. Yeah. But it's a, it's an awfully big world and there's an awful lot of people in this world and you're just a little speck and, uh, and God doesn't see you. You know, I mean, the devil doesn't come in, 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 for, in second person. He doesn't say, Hey, I'm the devil and I'm going to whisper yeah. a lie in your ear, right. but he'll, but he'll put those thoughts in your head right. and, and those thoughts will be in first person so it'll be, it'll be, they'll be your, they'll literally be your thoughts. And so the enemy will whisper lies and will, because one of the things that the devil wants is the devil wants to keep you believing lies because he knows that if you come into a revelation of truth, you're going to be set free. Right. So that's, so that's what the devil does. The devil will, the devil will feed you lies. Okay. And keep you bound by lies that's the only power that the devil has over a believer is to the extent that we're willing to believe him if we're if we believe his lie if 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 we believe his lies okay if he has if the devil has your belief system then the devil has your actions your your beliefs dictate your actions and your actions dictate what happens next. whether whether you're free or not right yeah. so 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 it's key deliverance is key we get the 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 demons out of a person and in essence what we do when when we kick a demon out of somebody we turn off the fountain of lies okay we turn off we turn off that that, you know, we, we remove the demon that is constantly being opposing truth. Right. Okay. We get them out. And then it's so key that once, once a person receives deliverance, then that person begins to, you know, then that person receives truth in its place. Okay. Yeah. Like once, once the demon comes out, it's important that we fill our hearts with truth and, as, you know, to tear down the strongholds that are left by the enemy. What is a stronghold? Strongholds are houses that are made of lies. So we yeah. get the demon out. We pull the demon out of that house. And now you got now you got a house that needs to be demolished. And we demolish the house of lies by truth. And the more we tear down those strongholds, the more free we become. I love that. Yeah. Is that cool or what? Yeah, this, um, this ministry is so key to a believer. To I mean, yeah. to, to to the to the victory of a believer. Right. So key. Yeah, I was a believer whenever I was born again, and the crazy thing is, is it wasn't a scripture that made me born again. Um, I was actually laying in bed, and it was like 
my fiance wouldn't stop yelling at me for this ridiculous stuff that I didn't love him enough whenever I was showing him all this love. And, you know, I went from really hating him to um, really asking God to deliver me from the demons. It was like God was speaking to me in that, like, and, and so like I went into a meditative state and I was like, God, please remove these demons. And, um, when, whenever I said that, like I prayed that prayer for like weeks, you know, but it, it wasn't working. Like I was just so severely depressed. And, um, that night it was like, I was almost sleeping and some a skeleton come down, like a couple inches from my face with like black eyes and white wings. And it scared me. And then all of a sudden it was sucked out into the universe, gone. And I opened my eyes up and I was like, oh my God, like what? And, and then it felt like I was like spinning around the room. Like it felt like I was spinning and I held the Bible and I turned on the Bible. And the next day I felt like I was like 20 pounds lighter. Like I felt so disoriented. I felt like I had lost all this weight. I felt free. And so like, that was what I claim to be the rebirth day because it was like, after that, God was just giving and giving and giving all this stuff to me that I wouldn't originally have even known. Like, it was just like, it would just come to me from out of nowhere. That's so funny that, that you should say that because every person, I mean, I've, prayed for many, many, many people for deliverance. And I don't tell them like, okay, this is what you're going to feel afterwards. But I would say 95% of the people when we're done with deliverance, they say, I feel light as a feather. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like I could just float away. Yeah. And, And the thing is like, you know, we're like, we carry this junk our whole lives yeah you know we carry this we carry this heaviness everything that happens yeah and you don't know what you're carrying until until you're not carrying it anymore Mm -hmm. you know when when god sets you free all of a sudden you're like oh my goodness man i feel like i feel like 50 pounds lighter you know it's crazy isn't it yeah yeah Yeah. so i yeah i had that was my rebirth day. God delivered me from the demons. And, and I was a believer whenever I was carrying them, but I knew that, um, I knew that they were there because they wouldn't stop. Like they wouldn't quit. So, right. Yeah. It's, I mean, this stuff, this stuff, this stuff is real and it, and the church needs it. The church needs the ministry of the, and God is restoring this ministry to the church, but the church this has been like such a necessary thing because the church is like so it it's so held down by the enemy there's a lot lot of churches that are dead um i I went to this one church for christmas eve and you know usually you go into a church and you feel the spirit and your arm hairs rise and you're just like it's like an overflow like instant like whoosh like a gust of wind and other people feel it too but I was in this church um it was a Lutheran church and these kids were singing and I felt the spirit come upon me and my arm hairs stood up and I was like I gotta stand up but everybody in the room looked dead to it I'm like this church is completely dead to the spirit they don't even feel it like what is happening right now? Um, it's, and it was scary. It's unfortunate. It's unfortunate because the majority of the church, we just don't know what we have. Yeah. Like, you know, that's one of the, that's one of the hardest parts, you know, is, you know, doing what I do. Like I, so I travel, uh, obviously um, yeah. I travel and I, and I do services kind of like what you where you met me, you know, where I do healing services and I do deliverance services. And we see like tons of people get healed and people getting set free. And we see, you know, joy and great worship and all that, you know, and it's like, and most of the church, there's so many in the church that don't understand that, like, like this is possible, that it's more than just coming in and punching your card. Okay, God, I'm here you know, listening to a, you know, a sermon and then getting up and leaving, like God, like, like God is setting people free. Right. God is healing. God's healing the sick. Do you know, when I was, I was in Guatemala, I just got back 
from Guatemala two days ago. From we were there for a week, and I mean, we saw hundreds and hundreds of people who who were healed. You know, so a girl, this girl was born without an ear. Okay, she was born without an ear. So her parents, you know, because they didn't want her to look funny, only having one ear, she. So they took, you know, skin from her side or from her leg or something, and they they built an ear, okay, just the outsides of, of the ear, right? But there was no inner ear, you know, they just, it was just basically for yeah. show. And so her father, her father brings her to, we would have a time of worship every morning before we did our, what we were there to do. And her father, her father brings her to the, to our worship. He was one of our interpreters. He brings her to the thing and he says, my, my daughter needs a miracle. And I said, what's, what's the matter with her? And he said to me, she can't hear. She can't hear out of her, out of her left ear. I'm like, okay. So I put my hand on her ear and I said, in the name of Jesus, I command this ear to hear. And I said, uh, her name was Sarah. I said, Sarah, can you, can you hear me? And she said, I hear you. I hear you a little bit. I was like, okay, cool. I prayed again in the name of Jesus. I command you ear open her ear open. I had no idea when I prayed for her. All I knew was that she couldn't hear. I didn't yeah. know that she didn't have an inner ear. God right. like touched that girl and gave her what she didn't have. Wow. And this girl, this girl is able to hear. I mean, you know, stuff like that. I mean, seeing, seeing legs grow out and, and, you know, scoliosis, spine straightening. And, and I've, and seen, I've, like, I've seen the girl with her arm, arm that grew like what, four or five inches that night that I was in the church, like seeing it right before your eyes that, you know, God can do these things. It's incredible. That's right. that, wasn't yeah. that cool? That girl yeah. has cerebral palsy. Yeah. Cerebral palsy. Yeah. I mean, most of the church doesn't know. Yeah. Most, no. most of the church doesn't know that God, that you don't have to live with anxiety. You don't have to live with depression. You don't have to live with suicidal thoughts. You don't have to live with that secret porn addiction. You don't, right. you don't have to live with that sickness. You don't have to live with that infirmity that you have, that Jesus right. is alive and what he did. He's the same yesterday today yeah. and forever if he was doing it then he's doing it now but he's doing it through his uh, body the church yeah. and it's like yeah. and you know but the church it's like you know i remember one time i was doing i was doing a, a youth meeting in uh in in ambridge pennsylvania and um so this church this church that brought me in they were partnering partnering with another church in the middle of the state and so, you know, so I was ministering to the two youth groups. And so some woman walks in, right? And she's looking for the pastor and she's got like a severe limp and she looked like she was in pain. And I said, you know, and I'm, I'm teaching these kids on healing. So I said, Hey, what's the matter with you? And she said, well, I just had back surgery two days ago. I said, are you in pain? She said, Oh, I'm in terrible pain. I said, come on up here. And so I wanted to demonstrate to the kids and I prayed for this woman and God healed her back. All the pain gone. She's bending over, touching her toes two days after surgery. I mean, it was amazing running around the church, just praising God. I go back to teaching and all of a sudden, you know, the, uh, the youth pastor, he like, all of a sudden I see him whispering to his, to his kids. Next thing you know, he and his entire youth group get up and walk out. Afterwards, I, I found him and I said, um, I said, you got a problem with healing, right? I said, it's the healing message. He said, well, I believe in, I believe that God heals. I just don't believe in healers. I'm like, okay. I said, so let me ask you something. I said, do you, do you pray when somebody's sick that you know? Do you pray for them? Well, well, yeah. And I'm like, so why is it okay for you to pray for the sick? but it's not okay for me to pray for the sick. Yeah. I said, can you, can you explain that? Why is it okay for you, but it's not okay for me? You know, and I, I said, I said, so basically here's your problem. It's only cool to pray for people. It's only acceptable. It's only good to pray for people as long as nothing happens. 
Is right. that is that what you're is that what you're saying? I know that. That's good. It's 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 okay to pray, just as long as nothing happens. That's good. But it, but the, as soon as something happens, if somebody actually, if God actually touches somebody, if somebody actually gets healed, then it's automatically a demon. It's got to be a demon, yeah, right? And oh, they yeah, said yeah. the same thing about Jesus. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, saying that he's casting out casting when out he, demons by yeah. the power of Satan. Yeah, yeah, they said the same thing. Um, there was a little girl in the church that night. She was probably about, I don't know, maybe like 12 or something like that. And um, there was this little baby that kept coming up to this little girl. And this little girl, like, would get like that. She And she would, like, look at the kid like the kid was going to kill her. Like, and the baby <laughs> was only, the baby wasn't even old enough to walk yet. You know, maybe about. I don't know, able to stand up, but not walk. And, and the baby kept like, the baby was relentless. The baby just kept going over to this <laughs> you know, girl and this girl just kept tightening up and like, get like scared of this baby. Right. But the baby was like smiling and everything with her. And then at the end, um, I don't know if you did a prayer for her or if you taught her mother how to do the prayer for her. Um, I kind of missed that part of it, but I did see that the 12 year old girl was over there vomiting. And then next thing you know, the 12 year old girl comes over. She starts asking about the baby. She's like, is that your baby? And I was like, no. And she's like, and I told her who the, ba who, who the baby belonged to. And she just couldn't take the smile off her face. She was playing with the baby like and she was just like and so happy and but what what really touched me after the, watching all that um is well it kind of made me uncomfortable because i kind of realized how intense this world really is um yeah. as far as demonic you know activity but um but what really you know, kind of sad in me is that, you know, I have this ministry and it's really to waken people up to there's much more to your story than being a victim, you know, and I really want yeah, to, yeah, I really want to, you know, just show people that there's more to life than just being a, being, being your journey, you know, um, but it, it's meant for a purpose. And, but also I pray for people and, you know, from a distance, most oftentimes, um, mm. but uh, there's like, that's not enough. It's not enough to just pray for people and minister this word. And I was like, it's just, it's not enough what I'm doing. Um, and mm. it really opened my mind up for like, people need much more than just a prayer or a good word. That's really what my ministry is. My ministry yeah, of course, I'm called to pray for people, and I do that all the time. But my job is to equip people. You know, the very thing that you're saying, you know what, I need to do this. My job is to help people to 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 get rolling in this. Um, right, and you do, and I seen I seen you do that in the church. You weren't um, so much about trying to show the 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 miracles and works of God, you know, and what god puts inside of us to be able to do that but you were showing people in the church this here you can do this let's yeah. let me show you how so yeah i mean think about this i how many people can i meet you know i mean you know right. i can only, i can only meet who i can meet right but if i but if i can equip an entire church right how many more how many people can yeah you know, and can receive you know that's the way and that's the way it's as as you know the the Bible says that he's given us the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist for the equipping, the, for the to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, not to do everything, but to yeah. teach, to teach the body. Look, I'm not the only game in town. God has yeah. given this to you as well. Here you go. Now get out and do it. It's right. exciting. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun watching people, you know, like I see all sorts of ministries being launched out now people who have, who have learned people who have, you know, and now they're going out and they're, and they're doing their own, you know, That's and awesome. then they're equipping, then they're equipping yeah. people. Yeah. That's the way it's supposed to be. 
Right. And I do feel that it's like, if it's all about just growing your church, I'm not sure that you have actually received what heaven was trying to give you because um, it's like once, once you really t- like connect with God, you start seeing fully in the world what used to exist in you and you only want to, you know, bring them the same things that God had brought you. And so you can clearly see why Jesus was willing to die on that cross that day because you know rightfully we would want to do the same thing because we just want everybody to know that they can you know that there is salvation there is a better way of life and you know you start seeing more clearly like all the pain and sadness and you know things like that in the world that you know Mm -hmm. god god just needs to get a hold of it you know yeah yeah absolutely absolutely like god and we're we're living in a we're living in a time now where the crazy has gotten a thousand times crazier. Yeah. Like like literally within the last few years, the crazy has gotten crazier, exponentially crazier, and it's going to get exponentially more crazy. And so this is the time. This is the time when God is like where where it's no longer you know a few here and a few there. But now we're in a season where it's literally all hands on deck, all hands on deck, where every believer is equipped and empowered, making disciples, because this thing is wrapping up like yeah. very, very soon. This this thing is wrapping up like within I within our lifetime, I have no doubt that we're going that that Christ is returning like within our lifetime. And so it's the way I see it, it's like, well, I had this revelation. I was a brand new believer, right? And now I've always done street ministry. I love street ministry. It's my passion. And I remember back when I was a brand new believer, my pastor was like, he was like, okay, we're going to, we're going to do street ministry. Feel the Lord is calling us back out to, you know, to do, you know, back, back out on the streets. He asked me, he's like, Kevin, everybody, he's like, Tennessee guys, like, Kevin, everybody else said, no, you're going to go out on the street with me. I'm like, and I wanted to be like, no, <laughs> but I'm like, uh, uh, oh, okay. So, so, so he's like, I'm like, why did I have to sit where I sat? If I had sat on the other side of the room, I could have been the first person to tell him no. Well, anyway, um, he makes me wear this, this, he makes me wear this red windbreaker, right? Dad insult the injury, right? I look like Bob the tomato, you know, from Veggie Tales, you know? And so here I am, you know, he says to me, you don't have to talk. He said, I know this is your first time. Don't feel like you have to say anything. If you feel comfortable, then you could talk, but don't just watch me. I said, okay, I can do that. So I'm standing out there and I'm acting like I'm like, like waiting for a cab, you know? He's like, over here and I'm like acting like I'm not with him because I'm kind of embarrassed you know and so all of a sudden I hear hey Kevin you here take this paper here and this tract and give it to this lady coming up the street I'm like hey man what about the deal I thought I didn't have to talk I thought I thought you know remember you don't have to say anything if you're not comfortable I'm like I'm not feeling all that comfortable but not wanting to look unspiritual I I took it right and this lady she's there's a point to all this, by the way. This lady, she comes, this lady comes walking up the street, right? And and I'm holding this tract. Now, a tract is for anybody that doesn't know, it's got the gospel message on it, right? And so I've got this, this little pamphlet in my hand, and she's coming up the street. And I mean, literally, my heart was like, da, 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 da. And, and as she approaches, I said, Can I give you something to read about Jesus? But literally, I was so scared my tongue like kind of gave out on me. And I was like, oh, you know, kind of did one of those. And she did, she didn't even look at me. She just walked by, snatched it out of my hand and kept going. I was like, oh, <sighs> I turned around, right? And so she's got this paper. And she's walking down the street and she's, and she's reading this paper. And I realized she's reading the gospel. Like right there, she's, she's she's getting the gospel and so something occurred to me andrea it occurred to me that 
that what I just did was eternal, right? What I just did was eternal. Like, like a million years from now, she's still going to be praising God for this little bald guy that approached her and handed her this piece of paper with the gospel message that she read and said, I need Jesus. She'll be praising God for, for every person that God sent to her I got with, the light, with the soul saving message of the gospel. Okay. Million years from now, still praising God for what I did. I got, yeah. I got on the other hand, on the other hand, she could have read that and said, forget that. And a million years from now in hell, okay, my face and what I did would be added to her torment as she thinks about every person that God tried to send to her with the eternity changing message of the gospel. And she'll think about all the times that she denied him. Yeah. Right. Either way, either way you can do, we can go and we can do good things for people. You can, you can mow your neighbor's lawn. You can give to the cancer society. You can give to give to make a wish, the make a wish foundation. You can do all these good things, but guess what? A million years from now, none of that is going to matter. None of it's going to matter. A million years from now, what we do with the gospel, what we do with the, with, with the gospel today, a million years from now is still going to matter. Right. Telling people about Jesus, giving the gospel of Jesus Christ away to any and every single person that we, that we meet is the only thing from this life that's going to matter a million years from now. And I would say that if, if sharing the gospel, putting ourselves out there, being willing to look like a fool, because really, if you're going to minister, you're taking a chance that you're going to look bad. You're going to, you're going to feel uncomfortable. You're going to feel all kinds of, you know, but if you're willing to do that, right. A million years from now, is still going to matter. Yeah. I've, I've made the decision that this life is nothing. What does this life matter? Right. We're going we're gonna to blink our eyes and we're going to be gone. Think about 30, the past 30 years. How, yeah. pa- how fast has 30 years gone by? Yeah. I, was 20, I was 20 years old two seconds ago. Right. We're going to blink our eyes and we're going to be gone. This, this, this life, okay, we, we have received, we have received the keys that unlocks the chains of, of eternity for people. Yeah. And, you know, if it's going to matter, if, if, if it's, if it's the only thing from this life, that's going to matter a million years from now, the way I see it is ministry, sharing the gospel should be our primary focus while right. we're here on this earth. Primary focus. Right. So I told you I had a point, I had a point to that story. <laughs> yeah. And I take that for granted um, oftentimes is, you know, the impacts that I do make. Um, I get into that um, self-condemnation, you know, that I'm not always perfect. And I don't see oftentimes enough that, you know, the, the impacts I do make. And I think that that's super crucial because God really does want to elevate us. And, you know, he wants us to put, put us in a place of leadership so that we can bring more light onto more people. And it's, it's really important that, you know, we understand that what we're doing, you know, is making a difference. Um, Mm. Yeah. 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 And, and not to, not to mention living, living on mission for God. I don't know. I, I wrote a book, Street Fisher, living on mission for God. And I talk about how, like, it's like the most exciting way to live. It is. It really is. It you know, is. You, you never know, know what's going to happen. You never, it's an, it's an, like church, like Christianity is so much more than just two hours on a Sunday morning. It's so much more than a 
Wednesday night Bible study, but it's like when you live your life, you know, when you live your life, you know, God, you know, to <clears throat> to minister, like going into into the grocery store, you know, you never know when you're walking yep. into a revival service, getting gas exactly. at a gas station is a healing service in the parking lot, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's like all of a sudden, out of nowhere, these these encounters just spring up yeah. and you walk away saying, right. oh my goodness, God, you are so real right. and you are right. so cool. And thank you, Lord. Yeah. yeah. I can be your, an amba- your ambassador, you know? Right. Amazing. Bring, yeah. Bring people to you that you're just, yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible journey. Um, one last thing I want to get to uh, talk to you about is, you know, I think Somerset County, where I live, 2% of the people go to church. Um, That was like a year ago. Mm -hmm. But um, to all the Christians that, you know, don't think that they need church, but they believe that their body is the church. um, How important do you think it is for people to connect as a body? There's a lot of people that aren't in the church because of they've been hurt in the church. Okay. And they say, well, you can't try, you know, pastors are all bad and blah, blah. I've heard that, you know, but how many know that, don't you know that like David, King David, okay. It took Saul, God placed him with Saul. And because of, you know, God uses the Saul's uh, to make David's out of us. God used Saul to form David, right? Yeah. You, like God can, God can use bad leaders to, to form us, to teach us just as I much like as that. That's good. he, just as much as he uses a good leader. And there's, there's, there's things that we'll never get if we're not like, there's aspects of God that we won't see, that we won't have a revelation of if we're all by ourselves. Right now, I'm not going to sit here and say that we all need to be a part. I believe that churches come in all shapes and they come in all sizes, different personalities, yeah. even. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying that you need to go to a church that's got a steeple and it's got, you know, pews and all that. Like house churches, like like house churches are amazing churches. You know, personally, I believe that that's the direction church is going where church is going to where there's going to come a day where churches are not going to be in these great big buildings, but they're going to be in people's living rooms. Now, you know, you know, as long as we are connected to a body, now that body could be five or six people, as long as we're connected to a group of believers. And as long as we're being, as long as we're being discipled. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, that's key, but it is imperative like lone rangers. Okay. If you think about, if you think about a lion, Okay. Think about a a pack, like a pack of lions. Okay. And they're, and they're, and they see a herd of antelope and they're going in to, to kill who, what do the, what do the lions go after? Do they go after the big herd? No, they don't go after the big herd. They go after the one that's That's separated, that's separated from the herd. It's so true. It's so, it's so important that, you know, if we're, if we're off by ourselves, if we're off by ourselves it's easier for the devil who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour it's easier it's easier for him to devour the one who's separated than it is for him to devour the one who's in community that's true right? Because in community, you got people praying for you. You've got people encouraging you. You've got people, uh, you know, discipling you. You've got people sharing the word with you. You've got all that and all and over here, not so much. Right. Not, it's it's vitally important. We need we need the church. People say, "Oh, the church is messed up. The church is messed up." It is what make it a is. Difference. Yeah. Don't make it, a difference. You, that's that's right. Don't be part of the problem. Be part of the solution. Get in there, yeah, right. and you and you rub difference. off on the church. Right. Change me, not change what it is. Yeah. I, I reach a level of maturity where it becomes about raising other people up and giving away right. what you what you received. Right. Right. I like that. It's important to be connected to the church because not only you know you got the 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 pastor who's gonna who's gonna you know 
who's going to teach you and keep you safe, but you've got a lot of other believers as well who are going to who are going to do the same. Church is it's vitally important. You know, the Bible says, "Do not forsake the assembling of the brethren." That, that Jesus said that Himself. Right. That you need that we need the church. Is the church mm-hmm. perfect? Absolutely not. But is God is God purifying His church? He's coming back for a pure and spotless bride. So what we've seen. It's not the way it's going to be. There's a purification process that's taking place in the church. And I think it's happening already. Absolutely. I mean, I've seen a huge change in the message just since COVID happened um, in the churches. So I think that they're starting to like evolve more so now than what they were before. But also I think about how God sent Ananias to Saul to open up his eyes to find it but like god had already told saul that ananias was coming so ananias came to saul as a confirmation you know from god so like these things i think oftentimes are like if if you're staying tapped into god it's like you're given these messages either in thought or from other people and then it's brought through the pastor or through the church to mm. confirm that too on your heart um mm. we don't always like what god has to say though <laughs> <laughs> yes that's the truth sometimes it's a little bit painful you when right. god puts his finger on something yeah so um, can you tell us uh, about Set Free Ministries and um, how we find you? Set Free Ministries, Set Free Ministries is, uh, you know, my ministry, and it is a healing and deliverance ministry, teaching, teaching the body of Christ how to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, how to do evangelism. I have a Facebook page, Set Free Ministries. But what I found is when you have a page, you know, like a business page or a ministry page, nobody sees it because Facebook true. Facebook doesn't let anybody see it. Facebook doesn't like Christians. I'm just being real. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. No doubt. So I don't, I don't, I don't push, I don't push my, you know, my ministry page just because it's just. But a lot of people find me uh, just my, by my name, Kevin Reardon, R-I-O-R-D-A-N. Um, I have a website, uh, setfreeweekends.com. It's a way that people get on and, you know, find out who I am. If they want to give, they give that way. And, you know, they, they can send a message. But Facebook is really the way that most people find me. I definitely recommend, you know, having you, having you come and uh you know go to your church because you really do you don't just um show people you know how like great god really is you know through your mission work but also like you're showing us what authority god has placed inside of us so yeah would you mind if before we uh before we we shut this off here before we we wrap up do you mind if i prayed prayed for a few people i'm just getting some some thoughts in my head some different things uh words of knowledge that god's given me concerning like different ailments that people who are watching this or who will watch this have and i believe that god wants to heal them it's pretty wild to see god heal somebody through through facebook he does yeah let us know down below if uh in the comments if yeah, if it's you. So. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just just pray uh, for healing for what God has kind of given me here. I feel like God is saying that He wants to heal backs, specifically like sciatica. So I'm gonna pray for that. So right now, in the name of Jesus, I speak to that devil sciatica, and I command right now in the name of Jesus, I command sciatica to come out of their back. I command right now in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave. In Jesus' name, leave now. There's somebody that's watching this that's literally feeling that moving down their leg right now. It's going to come out of your foot. In the name of Jesus, sciatica, I command you out now in the name of Jesus. And I also speak to the discs and the vertebrae. And I command the discs and vertebrae to be healed in Jesus' name. Right now, I command spines to realign bulging discs to move back into your place 
right now in the name of Jesus. I take authority over you and I command you in the name of Jesus, be healed right now. And I also speak, I also speak right now to cancer in Jesus' name. I rebuke cancer. I command cancer out of their body. And I speak right now to every tumor and I command you to disappear in the name of Jesus right now, right now, somebody with who's who had a cancer diagnosis, you're beginning to feel heat in that area where you've been diagnosed. And that's the, the power of the Holy Spirit touching you now. I also feel like there's some people that are dealing with lung issues. I'm going to command that out of you. And when I command that out of you, you're going to feel something come up into your throat and you're going to cough it out and you're going to find that your lungs are different, your lungs, that your breathing's different. In the name of Jesus right now, I speak to asthma, I speak to COPD, and I speak to every lung issue. I command that devil that's driving it now in the name of Jesus to come up and come out of them now in the name of Jesus. Come up and come out in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. So you're feeling something coming up in your throat now. I want you to cough that out right now in the name of Jesus. I speak restoration, restoration, restoration over your lungs right now in the name of Jesus right now in the name of Jesus, right now in Jesus' name. And I also speak to headaches, migraine headaches, migraine headaches in the name of Jesus. I command you now, 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 now in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Sure. Hey, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. This was Super a lot of fun. <laughs> It was a lot of fun. So um prayers for your travels and you know that it's safe and and uh that your ministry continues to grow and yeah. amen. Thank you. Amen. Yeah, I receive that in Jesus' name. All right. Well, God All right. bless. You have an awesome day. Thanks, you too. All yeah, right. Yeah, we'll exactly. Bye. If you like this podcast, please hit subscribe because we have an awesome guest coming up every week and I don't want you to miss out. God bless. Love you. I'll see you next time. Bye.